Hello and welcome to a tactical history of Liverpool. Last time we left off with Liverpool sitting 19th in the league in November, but it wasn't all bad. First of all, Bill Shankly clearly must have been impressed by Jeff Strong's part in Arsenal's comeback from episode 1, as Strong was signed in November for £40,000. He joined the club as an inside forward, but would soon be moved into midfield and would eventually end up at left back for Liverpool. Could play in the middle of the field, could play at the back. He played some fantastic games for us. If we'd have got Jeff Strong four or five years earlier, boy, he'd have been an even greater player. But he could have played in any team in the world, Jeff Strong. Secondly, Shankly took the opportunity to bring through Chris Lawler. The youngster had been playing as a centre-back in the reserves and covered for Ron Yeats a few times with the first team, but he became a regular at right-back, with Jerry Byrne moving across to the left. He would make this position his own for the next decade. A man of famously few words, Lawler preferred to do his talking on the pitch, mixing excellent defending with the attacking play of a modern fullback, ghosting into positions high up the pitch. Thirdly, Liverpool being out of a title race before Christmas allowed them to focus on other ambitions. Winning the league the previous season meant they got their first run at the European Cup. They started their travels with a trip to Iceland to play Kanatspurnafelag Reykjavik. Kanatspurnafelag Reykjavik. Kanatspurnafelag Reykjavik. We went to fly from Glasgow and uh, we had about five or six hours to kill in between the flight to, uh, to Iceland. And Shankly uh, took us to, he said, I think we'll go to Butlins for about four or five hours to pass a bit of time on. And we went to uh, the, the holiday camp and pulled up on the coach at the gate. And Shank thought everybody knew who we were, you see. And he said uh, to the, the security fellow, he said, we're Liverpool Football Club on our way to Iceland to play in the European cup tie and the bloke said well you're on the wrong road here pal <laughs> having thrashed from in the away leg to secure their place in the next round Anfield took to ironically cheering for the Icelanders in the second and were very happy when they scored in the 36th minute even if they would go on to lose 11-1 on aggregate things would get much tougher in the second round though as Liverpool were drawn against Belgian champions Anderlecht one of the best teams in Europe at the time the first leg at Anfield is most famous for it being the first time Liverpool wore their all red kit I was a guinea pig, and of course, you know, I, with the frame I've got, you know, he wanted me to try it on. Uh, he said, I think we'll look a bigger team. You know, we had a big, big team anyway, you know, and I tried it on, he went, Jesus Christ, he says, you look enormous, he said. <laughs> he even had me going out the main door, you know, no, nobody, in the, nobody in the stadium at all, I had all the red kit on the boots and everything, he went, just walk out the door, he says, and I'll stand on the pitch. So he's standing on the pitch and I had to walk out the door and he went, that's it, he says, we've got it, he says, you look twice as big as you really are. <laughs> it was also, however, the birth of a new tactical change. Shankly had gone on a scouting mission to watch Belgium play England in October, as many of the Belgian side played for Anderlecht. He did his usual song and dance routine to the players, telling them Anderlecht were useless, but privately he was concerned about the quality of the opposition, and so devised a new plan. They had been at Wembley and drawn with England, but really and truly they outclassed England. And I said to Joe Messer coming out of Wembley, I said, how the hell do you play with these, hey, Joe? And this was Anderlecht, of course. So I went over and seen them playing against Standard Liège one Sunday morning, uh, one Sunday afternoon, and I thought, well, we have a terrible match in my hands. He was particularly concerned about Paul Van Himst, enough for him to be one of the few players Liverpool would man mark, with a task falling to Gordon Milne. When we have the ball, come out and play it, Gordon, then pick him up wherever he goes, Shankly told him. Even with Milne watching Van Himst closely, Shankly wanted more cover, so he changed to a back four. There are claims that Boris Arkadiev was the first man to use a back four while at Dynamo Moscow, and the great Hungarian side of the 50s was almost there, having half-back Joseph Sicarius drop in between the full-backs. Yet it's generally accepted that the back four was at least popularised, if maybe not technically invented, in Brazil. Hosting the World Cup on home soil in 1950, Brazil beat Mexico and Yugoslavia to advance, before thrashing Sweden and Spain 7-1 and 6-1 respectively leaving them needing only a draw with Uruguay to win the trophy. Brazilians were proclaiming victory before a ball had even been kicked, and their claim was supported when they took the lead early in the second half. Then, the unthinkable happened. Uruguay came back to win 2-1 and claimed the trophy themselves. Everyone and everything was blamed, but being stung so badly taught Brazilian football a lesson. 
We had wonderful attacking players, but in order to get the best from them, they had to give them a solid defensive base to fall back on. One of the midfielders was drawn back into defence to form a back four, while one of the attackers was moved back into midfield, creating a 4-2-4. Initially, this withdrawn centre-back would push up to join the midfield when his team had the ball, but more and more this task was given to the full-backs, who were better placed to attack given they had space in front of them to advance into, and now had cover thanks to the additional centre-back. Eight years after the disaster at home, Brazil went to Sweden and won their first ever World Cup. In the wake of Brazil's success, more and more sides came to the same conclusion. Three defenders simply wasn't enough cover, and so they adopted the back four. As we saw in episode one, Liverpool had been having their own issues with the back three, and so, in poor form and going up against one of the best teams in Europe, Shankly made the switch. Teenager Tommy Smith was brought in to be Ron Yates' right leg when defending, then would push up into midfield when Liverpool had possession. Smith was quarried near the end of the Second World War, less than a mile from Anfield. A big lad for his age, Smith impressed playing schoolboy football and joined the club at 15. His father had died of pneumonia the year before and so his mother had been left reliant on payments linked to Smith's schooling to make ends meet. Yet the club rated Smith highly enough to buy him out of this arrangement and he went straight into the A-team, skipping two levels of Liverpool's developmental setup. By the end of his first season, Smith had already been promoted to the reserves and would make his debut for the first team at the end of the 1963 season. He had joined the club as a striker and regularly play as an inside forward, much to the amusement of Chris Lawler, who joked about Smith tackling the opposition defenders when it should have been the other way round. Smith learned a lesson in intimidation playing for reserves when senior pro Stan Lynn threatened to injure him during a game. This rattled him, and Smith played within himself as a result. The next time I received the ball, he said, I found myself thinking about Stan rather than what I was going to do with it. That day I learned you also have to be 100% fit mentally. Smith resolved never to allow another player to get to him again and took on the idea himself, snarling threats at opponents and fostering a hard man reputation. With Liverpool winning the league in 1964, Smith found first team opportunities hard to come by, however, and was growing impatient. Uh, we were playing uh, five aside one day and Chris was in the team and Tommy was younger than Chris but he wasn't in the team. And he was always knocking at the door and saying, when am I going to be in the team? I said, well, I can't play 12 players, Tommy. I said, there'll be an objection. See, so one day we were playing at five aside and uh, uh, Tommy slid into Chris and he caught him with the soles of his feet and the ankle, you know. Oh, a real sore, a real sore tackle it was. And Chris, before he got on the floor, his ankle was all blown up, you know, bloody sore ankle. So this is the, the, the thinking of Tommy Smith and all that be connected with us. Uh, we're all disturbed about Chris, you know, I thought Chris is going to be out of the game. It might have been Wednesday even, or Wednesday, Thursday, I'm not sure. So as we were coming off uh, from the five-a-side pitch over to the pavilion, which is two, two lengths of the pitch away, Tommy says to me, he says, will it be in the team on Saturday? <laughs> he just come on Chris, <laughs> wanted to take his place. That's absolutely true. He made a few solid appearances playing as an inside forward early on in the 64-65 season, scoring two goals, but found himself dropped again until the match against Anderlecht. Shankly was reluctant to throw the youngster in for such a big game, but Yates and Ian St John eased his nerves, telling him Smith had been a man since he was eight years old. Shankly had one last trick up his sleeve. Smith was sent out with a number 10 shirt, usually reserved for the inside left, despite playing as a defender. That leaves Tommy Smith with 10 in his back. He was sweeping up, of course. Despite the man said to me, he said, you're inside now, doesn't score many goals. <laughs> it was only sweeping up at the back. This would confuse teams for years, with opposition halfbacks pushing forward to man Mark Smith and commentators regularly referring to him as an inside left, despite him playing at the opposite end of the pitch. And remember, of course, that Liverpool bring their inside left back into the defence. That's Smith, the inside left. The plan worked brilliantly, with Liverpool winning 3-0. In the return leg, Liverpool went away to Brussels, sat back and frustrated Anderlecht. St. John said the Belgians played brilliant football, even better than Inter Milan, but it wasn't enough, with Roger Hunt sealing another Liverpool victory in the 90th minute. The wing coincided with an unbeaten run in the league that lasted until late February, as Liverpool clambered back up to sixth place. Whether it was the emergence of Lawler and Smith, signing of Strong, or change to a back four, things started clicking again for Liverpool. The victory over Anderlecht meant Liverpool progressed to face Cologne in the quarter-finals. The first leg finished goalless, with Liverpool simply trying to get through the game on a frozen pitch, as did the second leg, rearranged after it was initially snowed off, 
Liverpool supporters having a snowball fight on the pitch as they waited to leave the stadium, necessitating a third leg to be played on neutral ground in Rotterdam. Both teams matched up in 4-2-4 formations, however it didn't make for an attacking start to the game, with neither side really able to create chances. It was Liverpool that were having the better of the opening stages though. Ian Callaghan would tuck inside into the midfield defensively, but also sometimes when Liverpool had possession. Tommy Smith would frequently push up into midfield when Liverpool had the ball, while Ian St John would drop off too, leaving Roger Hunt to lead the line by himself. With these players drawn in Gordon Milne and Willie Stevenson, Liverpool were able to control the midfield. They may not have been creating lots of chances from it, but by outnumbering Cologne in the centre they were at least able to play around them into attack. Cologne, on the other hand, were having a tough time progressing the ball thanks to Liverpool having so many bodies in midfield. Most of the time they were simply pumping the ball down the wings, trying to turn Liverpool's slow back line by hitting it in behind them. The problem was that they weren't really doing enough to draw out Liverpool's defenders, so even if they were slow, the back line usually had a big enough head start to get to the ball first and reclaim possession. As Cologne's attackers also wouldn't track back defensively, we were simply handing possession over to Liverpool, then allowing them to waltz forward and overload the overworked midfielders. Wolfgang Overath was the only real bright spot going forward for Cologne, finding the space to pick out some nice passes. It was enough to convince Shankly that the next time Liverpool faced Cologne, Overath had to be man-marked, with Emlyn Hughes watching him closely. It took Liverpool 22 minutes to make a breakthrough. They won possession back in their own half and Stevenson had space in front of them to advance into, knocking the ball around Wolfgang Weber to Hunt dropping off. With a clearly injured Weber limping, Stevenson simply ran past him into space to receive the ball back off Hunt, who in turn ran into the large gap he had created for himself, drawing his marker out by dropping deep. Stevenson slid a pass through for Hunt to run onto and he drove towards the near post, forcing the goalkeeper out to meet him before cutting the ball back for St John to tap into an empty net. St John had created space for himself by running towards the far post, then cutting back across the six-yard box when the defender followed him. With Weber barely able to move, Hans Stern was moved back into defence and Overath was moved back to cover for him deeper in midfield, taking away what little attacking threat Cologne had mustered, and therefore further handing control to Liverpool. Peter Thompson had a quiet start to the game, with Fritz Pott giving him little space on the left, forcing him into coming deep to get on the ball. Callahan was having some joy with his more direct dribbling style, drawing Anton Reg into a tackle then bursting past him into space. Callahan and Thompson had started to switch flanks even before the first goal had gone in, aiming to disrupt Cologne's man marking, and with Callahan often dropping deeper in midfield, Thompson would come across into the centre or take up his position on the right. This meant that there was space down the left, where Jerry Byrne could push forward into. Whereas previously the full backs had needed to stay back to protect their centre back, the switch to a back four meant they had more cover, giving them the freedom to advance into attack. The switch to a back four also meant Milne wasn't constantly required to drop in next to Yates defensively, allowing him to stay in midfield and giving him more licence to join the attack. With Callahan sometimes holding back in a deeper position, Milne was able to push forward and fill in for him on the right. Liverpool doubled their lead when a Cologne defender advanced, only to have no teammate to pass to, and was robbed of the ball in his own half. Thompson, playing through the centre, dribbled forward on the ball, and while the initial attack broke down, Thompson and Milne combined before spreading the ball out to Callahan to cross. Hunt met the cross with his head, and while it initially only hit the crossbar, the ball had enough spin on it to bounce back across the line as it fell back down. Cologne would pull a goal back minutes later though. Even with all their dominance, Liverpool kept giving away cheap free kicks in dangerous areas. They were finally punished for it, as Carl Heinz Thielen darted ahead of Yates to get his head to the ball. If Liverpool had dominated the first half, then Cologne definitely had the better of the second. Literally playing with a broken leg, Weber was sent forward to make up the numbers up front, while Johans Law dropped back into midfield, with Law providing energy in midfield and making difficult to track runs from deep into attack. Cologne suddenly found themselves able to progress the ball. It wasn't just Cologne though. Liverpool started to drop off to protect their lead, making it easier for Cologne to come forward. They also began to give the ball away sloppily, put under pressure by Cologne players chasing after the ball in need of a goal. Cologne equalised with a long ball forward. Burns seemed to have the situation under control only to lose the ball out wide, and with Yates called across to cover, Stevenson dropped into the back line to plug the gap. This opened up space on the edge of the area where Laura arrived from deep to shoot first time, squeezing the ball just inside the far post. 
Law continued to prove a nuisance, with Yates slashing out at him after another run from deep saw and bump into the Scot. Cologne also had another goal disallowed. Overath hit a ball in behind to Law, making a run down the left. The Yates was slow to retreat and so Thielen was free to attack the ball, leading to a goal mouth scramble. However, the attacker was judged to have fouled Lawrence. Cologne were on the up, but the main problem was that their comeback was based upon extensive running by Law. As soon as they began to tire, Liverpool took back control. Just as Law had threatened with runs from deep, Milne was ghosting into attack. Cologne were particularly susceptible to this as they generally man-marked, so their setup wasn't built to be recognising Milne making these runs from unthreatening areas into dangerous ones. Nevertheless, both teams grew very tired as the game went on, and were a few further chances as the match fizzled out. Having already gone to a replay an extra time but still hadn't decided the tie, which team was to advance still had to be settled. Yugoslav teams had been using penalty shootouts to decide draws as far back as the 50s, but they wouldn't be accepted until 1970 by the International Football Association board, and so the victors were instead decided on the toss of a coin, or in this particular case, a disc painted in the team's colours. The referee threw the disc in the air, but it landed on its side, stuck in the mud. Seeing it was leaning to Cologne's side, Yates insisted the referee had to throw it again. When it fell back down, Liverpool were through to the semi-finals. Terrible moment because it came down, it was leaning over to the red, he picked it up and tossed it again. However, it came down and it was red again, so we'd won. Because the, the number three, he, he was crying like a baby, so I gave him a hanky. <laughs>